History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 312th episode of the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. On this episode, I'm going to be bringing you Haunted Cemeteries 15. I know many of you are very happy to hear that because you love the Haunted Cemeteries episodes. I'm going to be bringing four of them to you. But before we get into that, we have some people to welcome into the Spooktacular crew. Asher, Donna, Steve, Sarah with an H, Laura, Michael, Tanya, Jen with one N, Amanda, Wise, Kathleen, Brian, Michael, John, Megan with an H in the middle there, Carly with a Y, Debbie with an IE, and Ariel. Welcome, everybody. And now, this moment, Naughty. Back in September of this year, 2019, a story ran on Cleveland 19's website that a six-foot-long boa constrictor was found in the front yard of a home in Brecksville, Ohio. Obviously, somebody had let the snake go free. This isn't the first time that a town in Ohio had to deal with a large snake. Only the story I'm referencing in this oddity segment was about a 19-foot-long python. The story goes that a carnival truck was passing through Summit County in northeast Ohio, just south of Cleveland, in 1944 when the driver lost control and smashed into Ira Cemetery. The driver was killed and his cargo was set free, this 19-foot-long python. The first person to see the snake was Clarence Mitchell, and he told the Cleveland Press, I don't know what made me look up, but there, about 15 paces away, was the biggest snake I'd ever seen, sliding along easy and slow in plain sight on the bare ground. I just stood quiet, not aiming to attract attention. It seemed like 10 minutes I watched. He slid into the river, swam across, and climbed out the other side. He was as thick as my thigh right here, and every bit of 15 feet long, more like 18, sort of brownish spotted. I went over and looked at the track. It was like you'd rolled a spare tire across my field. Sightings continued for weeks, and soon there was a peninsula python posse formed. A person would report seeing the python, but the posse was always a couple of hours behind the snake, which was reported to have a head as big as a man's head. Evidence it would leave behind included this wide tire-like track. The town was getting hysterical about the snake, but there were those who didn't believe the reports of the snake were real. Eventually, the python was no longer seen and just seemed to disappear. The town of Peninsula never forgot those days of python hysteria, and to this day they hold an annual Peninsula Python Day Festival. And that certainly is odd. And now I'd like to share a promo from one of my new favorite podcasts. Hi, I'm Vanessa, and I'm the host of Fabled, a bi-weekly podcast that explores mysteries, legends, lore, ghosts, and fairy tales. Investigation of these tales of woe often reveal grim details that have been long hidden in dark corners of history. Every story is a mix of both fact and fiction, and so are the episodes. Look for me anywhere you listen to podcasts, and say hello on social media at Fable Collective. So go ahead, settle in. I want to tell you a story, and then maybe I'll tell you the truth. And now, this month in history. In the month of October, on the 17th in 1943, the Burma Railway, also known as the Death Railway, was completed by the Empire of Japan. This was a 258-mile railway between Bangkok, Thailand and Rangoon, Burma. 
There'd been plans for this stretch of railway since the late 1880s, but the terrain was dangerous and so plans were abandoned. During World War II, the Japanese wanted to avoid having to use a 2,000-mile passage through the sea to move supplies to back up their forces in Burma, so they began construction on the railway in June of 1942. The effort was considered an engineering feat with over 600 bridges and was completed ahead of schedule. A quarter of a million civilian laborers and POWs worked on the project, with 90,000 civilian laborers and more than 12,000 Allied prisoners dying during the construction. Hence why it was nicknamed Death Railway. In 1947, the line was eventually closed, but the section between Nan Pla Duk and Nam Tok was reopened 10 years later. Cemeteries are all unique, and there are many varieties from classic Victorian garden cemeteries to forgotten and overgrown burial grounds for criminals. I love each and every one, although a handful make it onto my top 10 list. And on this episode, I will share a new one that has been added to that list. I always hope that in doing these haunted cemetery episodes, that I will transfer my love of cemeteries to the portion of the audience that aren't already taphophiles. I know many of you are. And this love will continue to grow and spread so that we have less and less stories of vandalism in graveyards. Unfortunately, there are stories of vandalism inside some of these cemeteries on this episode. Each also has tales of unexplained activity. Join me as I share about Bass Cemetery in Birmingham, Salem Cemetery in Winston-Salem, Woodpecker Hill in Canyon City, and Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta. First up, we have Bass Cemetery, which is found in Birmingham, Alabama on County Road 147. This cemetery was established about 160 years ago and is bordered by woods and a railway. The cemetery gets its name from the first known burial here for a Revolutionary War soldier named Burwell Bass, who died in 1831. He was born in 1752 in Virginia and was the first white man to settle in Roebuck Springs with his wife Elizabeth Jane York. There are over 320 burials that include Civil War soldiers, slaves, and Montezuma Goodwin, a farmer who was shot and killed by his brother-in-law, James Sims, in 1904. Apparently, Goodwin had gone to Sims' house over some kind of a family feud and threatened him with a knife. Later, the two men met on the road, and Sims shot Goodwin three times. No one knows exactly who or what is haunting the cemetery, but people claim to hear disembodied screams and strange pictures have been taken inside. This is also one of those cemeteries where teenagers like to challenge each other. There's the familiar legend of fogged up windows after cutting off the engine, and then when the kids get out of the car, they find handprints all over the car. Now, I'm not going to get into what might be possibly fogging up those windows, but the stories that I read were trying to make it into some kind of a paranormal experience. Teenagers in a car, I don't know, but needless to say... They'll hear some noises, feel some pushing on the car. We've heard this on crybaby bridges as well. They get out and there's these handprints all over the car. And then, of course, there are the rumors of satanic rituals. What is a cemetery without at least one story about a satanic ritual going on inside? You know me, I don't give that stuff a lot of credibility. The Alabama Haunted Houses website has a comment from a poster going by Giant Dropper. That's a great name that says, probably over 10 years ago, went there on the week of Halloween with my girlfriend, best friend, and sister. We walked around a while and looked at the tombstones. They started playing with a Ouija board on the trunk of my sister's car. They were just having innocent fun. I was leaning up against the car, just staring at the tree line. I was facing the moonlight. In the woods, I saw the tall man. He walked just from one tree to another. His stride was about six or eight feet. I made everyone get in the car immediately and didn't tell them until we were halfway home, and I've never been back. Well, if you're going to be crazy enough to play with a Ouija board in the middle of a cemetery, I think you kind of get whatever you are asking for there. 
And another comment on the Alabama Pioneers website by someone named Nicholas says, been there quite a few times in my life. Just went there with my dad and nephew this night, and we didn't expect anything to really happen, but we all watched a very bright and vivid orb moving through the woods towards us. Then we stood there and talked about what we saw, and it returned a second time, but it was half as bright, then vanished again. We decided it was time to go after that. Has anyone else experienced this orb thing? I'm going to assume that there wasn't somebody walking around the woods with a flashlight. This cemetery has suffered a lot of vandalism, and even a former crypt was destroyed, rebuilt, and destroyed again. So it definitely needs some tender loving care there. Next up, we're going to Winston-Salem in North Carolina to the Salem Cemetery. And this is actually a cemetery that I have visited. The Salem Cemetery in Winston-Salem is located at 301 Cemetery Street, right next to the God's Acre Cemetery that belongs to the Moravian Church. This cemetery was established for the burial of non-Moravian people in 1850. We talked about the Moravian people in episode 108. That's when we were talking about haunted Old Salem. And I had the pleasure of visiting Old Salem a couple of years ago, and I walked through both of those cemeteries, God's Acre and Salem Cemetery. They are very different, with God's Acre being very uniform, with flat gravestones that all look the same. Whereas the Salem Cemetery is your standard large cemetery with upright stones and a more haphazard design. There's hills, lots of trees, that kind of thing. God's Acre has no stories of hauntings, but there is a haunting tale connected to the Salem Cemetery. Before we talk about the ghost stories, let's talk about some notable burials here. There's General William R. Boggs, who was a Confederate general during the Civil War, and since he worked as a civil engineer, he helped to design fortifications for the seaports. On the east side of Savannah is Fort Boggs, which was named for him. He had attended West Point with several other men that would go on to be Union generals. So basically, he was probably fighting some of the same guys that he'd gone to school with. He went back to engineering after the war and eventually moved to Winston-Salem, where he died at the age of 82. One of the famous burials here is for a man who brought us lung cancer, R.J. Reynolds. He was born in 1850 to a tobacco farmer and soon joined the family business. He eventually sold his share and moved to Winston-Salem where he started his own tobacco company and was soon the wealthiest man in the state of North Carolina. He died in 1918 of pancreatic cancer and was buried in the family plot here in Salem Cemetery. Another notable burial is for Zachary Smith Reynolds, who was the son of this tobacco magnet, R.J. Reynolds. He was born in 1911 and got into flying very young. And because of his love for aviation, the Smith Reynolds Airport in Winston-Salem was named in his honor. Both of his parents were dead by the time he was 13, and an uncle raised him and his siblings. Zachary married young at the age of 18 to a woman named Anne. They had one child, but the marriage would not last long, as he began an affair with an actress named Libby Holman. That couple would have one child who was born premature, weighing only 3.5 pounds. Although it was at a time when medical was not as good, their son Topper survived and lived to the age of 17 when he died in a climbing accident. Zachary was the youngest heir to the tobacco fortune when he died from a gunshot wound at the age of 20. He was found at his family's estate with a bullet wound in his head under mysterious circumstances. His wife, Libby, would later be indicted for murder, but the charges were later dismissed by the Reynolds family. I'm not sure if it was suicide. Libby did holler after the sound of a gunshot was heard. Smith's killed himself, and possibly they didn't want to admit that he had killed himself, and then they finally did, or if there just wasn't enough evidence. The latter seems to be the case with rumors that Libby was having an affair with a friend of Zachary's who was at the house, heard the gunshot, and helped take the wounded Zachary to the hospital. Reynolds is buried in the family plot at Salem Cemetery. Now, there's a story about something that happened in town that led to a burial here that led to a haunting. The Moravians were a moral people, and they were not happy when the town became the county seat. They worried it would bring drinking and crime, and of course it did. They had a fix for that bad behavior sitting right in the middle of town, a whipping post. Anyone found drunk on the street was sentenced to at least 13 lashes. Some got as many as 40. The whipping post got a ton of action with gamblers, ladies of the evening, drunks, and criminals all getting their turn. One day in the late 1850s, a woman arrived in town who seemed to have some mental issues. 
Obviously, at this time, there was no real care, and she wandered about the streets, shouting at people and carrying on to the point that people nicknamed her the unwanted guest of Winston. She was brought to the whipping post to be punished for what I don't know, I guess just yelling at people on the street. She seemed to gain clarity before the whipping began, and she called out a curse on the town and the people there. Then the whipping began, and when it was finished, she was dead. Even though this was very public, the town tried to hide what happened by whisking the body quickly away to the Salem Cemetery and dumping her in the ground without a casket and without a headstone. It was shortly after this that the hauntings began. There were glowing ghost lights and strange sounds. Multiple shadow figures would be seen traversing the grounds. Whenever a funeral was held in the cemetery, people would claim to see the apparition of the woman. She would have a smirk on her face and say, They're with me now and all of you will never see them again she would then disappear. The moans and screams coming from the cemetery became so much that it was decided to disinter the woman and move the body to a graveyard near Liberty. Eventually, that cemetery disappeared when a new railway was brought into that town. It is said that the Salem Cemetery is now peaceful. I got this story from Michael Bricker's book, Haunted Winston-Salem, and I haven't found any historical evidence that this actually happened, so it could just be a bit of ghost lore, but I found it to be an interesting story particularly the idea that a town would have a whipping post in the middle of it and punish people in front of the crowd by whipping them. Now we're off to my old stomping grounds, Colorado, to Woodpecker Hill in Canyon City. Woodpecker Hill is the nickname for an area found on the bluff above Greenwood Cemetery in Canyon City, Colorado. There are over 600 burials in this Pioneer Cemetery, and the ones on Woodpecker Hill feature rusted, bullet-riddled license plates for headstones. Everyone buried here on the bluff was a former prisoner, and that's why it is more overgrown and less cared for than the rest of the cemetery. The prisoners' headstones mostly just state CSP inmate for Colorado State Penitentiary inmate. Woodpeckers have left their mark on the cedar grave markers as they tried to splinter the wood to get to bugs, and that's where the nickname comes from. This cemetery was established about the time of the Civil War. Notable burials here include former Colorado Governor James Hamilton Peabody, who was born in Vermont in 1852. While he was at college in Vermont, his family relocated to Pueblo, Colorado. He followed them when he graduated and worked as an accountant for the family's dry goods store for three years. He then moved to Canyon City and worked for James Cleland at his store. He married James' daughter and they had four children and he eventually bought the store in 1882. In 1885, he got into politics and worked his way up until he was elected the 13th governor of Colorado. During his governorship, there were a lot of problems with minor strikes, particularly over hours worked in a day. Things got so bad that on June 6, 1904, the Independence Railway Station in Victor was destroyed by dynamite, killing 13 people. The Colorado National Guard was eventually called in to bring peace. Peabody helped the mine owners to crush the union of the miners, and this did not go over well. As a result, he was not re-elected. But things aren't as clear as that. You see, both the Republicans and Democrats committed major election law violations. It appeared that Peabody's opponent, the Democrat, won. He took office on March 17, 1905, but the legislature was controlled by Republicans, and they voted to remove him from office that day. They reinstalled Peabody, but they knew that wouldn't go over well, so they insisted that he agree to resign as a condition of him being reinstalled. He did, and thus the governorship went to his lieutenant governor. So Colorado actually had three different men as governor on that same day. And Colorado is the only state with that claim to fame. Peabody died on November 23, 1917, and was buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Another notable figure is Robert Alexander Cameron. He was a brigadier general during the Civil War, fighting on the side of the Union. Cameron was a doctor, and as a matter of fact, he was one of only two physicians that attained the rank of major general officer during the Civil War. He eventually moved to Colorado and would become Greeley's town superintendent in 1870. In 1885, he became the warden at the Colorado State Penitentiary and served until 1887. He died in 1894 at the age of 66 and has been buried here at Greenwood Cemetery. Now let's wander on up to Woodpecker Hill and take a look at some of the prisoners we have buried here. One of them is Joe Aridi. He was developmentally behind, and most say he had the intellect of a five-year-old. He was accused of attacking two young girls, Dorothy and Barbara Drain. They were sisters and aged 15 and 12, respectively. Both girls had been hit with an axe. Dorothy perished, but Barbara survived. 
Aridi was 23 at the time, and the police managed to coerce him into a confession. Obviously, since he was a little developmentally behind, he was very easily coerced. There was no proof that he actually had anything to do with the crime, but he was convicted and sentenced to death. The warden said he was the happiest man he'd ever seen on death row because Aridi had no concept of death. He was executed in the gas chamber and smiled as the guards strapped him in. The warden is said to have wept as Aridi died in the chamber. Governor Bill Ritter pardoned him 72 years after he was killed. Edward Ives is another prisoner buried here. He killed a police officer and wounded another, so he was sentenced to death. He was hanged using a unique hanging apparatus. The state of Colorado had found it hard to find a proper way to hang someone cleanly, meaning in a way that snapped the neck easily. Too many prisoners had been left hanging and writhing for many minutes until they would die. So they developed a pulley system that would send a weight hurtling down a chute when a guard pulled a lever. This would pull the rope taut as the prisoner fell through a trap and was supposed to break the neck. It kind of threw him up into the air, and I guess when he came back down and that rope went taut, it was supposed to break his neck. Well, this Edward Ives was a little guy. He only weighed 80 pounds. When the weight fell, he went flying up towards the ceiling, pulling the rope off the pulley, and he fell to the floor. He starts laughing and cheering for himself. He thought he'd beat the system. And this is after this guy tried to pretend like he was crazy and he was doing all this stuff to try to get off. And part of the reason I think why he had gotten himself down to 80 pounds is he was hoping for this to actually happen, that he would not weigh enough to actually be hanged. He was given no reprieve, though. Two more attempts were made with the final one working, although it took 23 minutes for him to strangle to death. This and a couple of other botched hangings got the Colorado legislature to switch to the gas chamber for executions. William Cody Kelly is also buried here. He was the first man ever killed in the gas chamber in Colorado. His grave is covered with tumbleweeds and prickly pear cactus, perhaps as a reflection of the man. His crime was awful. In 1934, he wrapped a rancher up in barbed wire and then he beat him to death with a pipe. And there's a legend that James Armstrong was such a violent and dangerous criminal that when he was put to death and then buried, the warden ordered that his cell door be buried over the coffin. A metal detector has proven this legend to be true. The last man killed in the gas chambers buried here too, Luis J. Monhey. There was a riot at the jail in 1929 that killed three inmates and eight correctional officers. Those three inmates are buried here, Danny Daniels, A.H. Davis, and Red Riley. And perhaps even with that cell door over the burial, James Armstrong has made good on his promise to return after death. There are many claims of haunting activity. There are the standard reports of orbs and shadowy figures, but people also claim to hear the laughter of children, which seems odd since not many children are buried here. Cold spots are felt, and a ghost tour features the cemetery as one of the most haunted spots in Canyon City. And now we are on to one of my favorite cemeteries. It's just been added to my top 10 list, and this is Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta. There is so much to share about this cemetery. I am just going to be skimming over the top of it because I could literally go on and on for hours about the history here, the people buried here, the things that you can see here. It's just amazing. Oakland Cemetery is located in the heart of downtown Atlanta and is not only a cemetery, but an arboretum full of flowers like roses and irises and daffodils and mums. And obviously, since it's an arboretum, it's got all variety of different trees. We had the pleasure of visiting on our recent trip to Atlanta, and this cemetery has become one of my favorite, as I said. The main gate is made of simple red brick, and this red brick forms many of the walkways inside. So you're not just walking down dirt paths. The paths are laid out for you. You're either walking on pavement or you've got bricks beneath you most of the time. The cemetery is broken into several sections. You've got the Jewish Flat, the Potter's Field, the African American Grounds, Bell Tower Ridge, the Confederate Memorial Grounds, and the original six acres. And there's even more areas than just that. As we entered, a light rain fell that continued to pick up, but we were undeterred as we wound our way through the cemetery with Tammy and Brian Burroughs guiding us along the way. Thank you guys so much for coming down to meet up with us. Hello, losers. How are you? Good morning on a Sunday. We are at Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Oh my gosh, this place is gorgeous. If you ever get a chance to come to Atlanta, you've got to check out the Oakland Cemetery. As you can probably hear, it is pouring rain, but we're still having a good time. I'm going to take you around and show you some of the sights here. Let me just turn this around. Look at how gorgeous this thing is. This place is huge. Yesterday, they had a special 5K here called Run Like Hell. And uh, Christy Bacon, who is one of the fellow Spooky Crew members, ran that yesterday. She also did it last year. And I'd wanted to do it last year. We didn't get a chance. And then I was going to... I was like, oh, we're there to do it this year, but unfortunately I was speaking yesterday at noon and I was like, there's no way I can get over there, run the 5K and be back in enough time. Maybe next year we'll get to do it. We're here with uh, Tammy and Brian Burroughs, who are also Spooky Crew members. They came over with us. We had some breakfast this morning and then we decided to head over to the cemetery before we leave town. Look at that. Just gorgeous. You got it through the door? Yeah, you can see the, the colors of it a lot better through the door. This is also, as you can see, when you look around, full of trees, right? So it's also one of those fabulous cemeteries that's an arboretum as well. I can't even imagine how old this tree is here. Looks like a magnolia to me. I have never seen a magnolia do this with its limbs. I mean, they are all over the place. It's got to be hundreds of years old. Oh my gosh, I am totally in love with this cemetery. Look at this. Got a great window in there too. And as you can see, they have different material that they've used here too. So we've got some, I would say that's probably marble. Got some benches for sitting all around. So it's really made to be like a park too, as should be the case. A must stop is the Bell Tower, which now houses a visitor center and gift shop full of books. We walked out with several in hand. One of them that I picked up about the cemetery was written by Kathy J. Kamerlin and is titled The Historic Oakland Cemetery of Atlanta, Speaking Stones. I love that title, Speaking Stones. There are so many things to love here from the variety of trees and vegetation to the statues to the huge mausoleums. And when I say huge, I mean huge to the intricate symbols on the headstones. And there are some ghost stories as well. And it was cute when we were walking around with Tammy and Brian and I was visiting with Tammy, I said, this place has got so much history in it. It's got to have hauntings. Have you heard anything? And she said, no, but you're right. I'm sure it is. So when I got home, I started looking up stuff. And sure enough, I found a few things, which I was glad because I wanted to feature it on a haunted cemetery so I could talk to you guys about it. Oakland Cemetery was first known as Atlanta Cemetery and was established in 1850 after the city of Atlanta outgrew its downtown municipal cemetery. The original grounds were just six acres of farmland, but additional land was bought over time and today it is 48 acres. There are approximately 70,000 people buried here. Anyone who died in Atlanta from 1850 to 1884 would have been interred here and the first person buried here was the wife of the farmer who sold the initial acreage to the city. Her name was Agnes Wooding. The cemetery took on elements of Victorian influence and became a park for the city with cast iron benches and hosted many picnics. The next burial was for Dr. James Neeson, who died in Atlanta in 1850 while attending a physician's conference. He was afraid of being buried alive, as so many people back in the Victorian era were, and he must have known that he was going to die, or maybe it was just a request he'd made to somebody that, in general, that whenever he was buried, he wanted this to happen. He requested that his jugular vein be severed before he was buried. So there was a doctor in attendance at his burial who did that right before they put him in the coffin and into the ground. He is in the original six acres. There are many notable burials here. One belongs to the first mayor of Atlanta, who was Moses W. Formwalt. He was a self-made man making his fortune in the tin and copper business. Much of the copper was made into stills, and he was against prohibition, of course. When he ran for mayor, he ran against an opponent that was a law and order kind of guy and pro-prohibition candidate. He won and served for one year. He later became deputy sheriff, and in 1852, he was stabbed to death by an inmate he was escorting from council chambers. For some reason, he was placed in an unmarked grave. I mean, you think this guy was the first mayor of Atlanta, he would get at least a marked grave. In 1907, he was moved to a better plot and given a marker near the Bell Tower. And speaking of the bell tower, 
It is Romanesque in style and was built in 1899. The first floor originally had a chapel and office for the sexton, with living quarters for the sexton on the second floor. The watch house was built in 1901 and is the office for the cemetery security team. The first greenhouse in Atlanta was also here in the cemetery and is still located here, but in a different form. The original was built in the 1870s, then replaced in the early 1900s. Because of neglect, much of it was removed in the 1970s, but the brick walls still remained, and now there's a new greenhouse that was donated in 2015. And it had all kinds of flowers growing in it, from what we could see, including orchids. Another notable burial is for the first African-American mayor of Atlanta who was elected in 1974, Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr. He served for three terms and helped bring the Olympics to Atlanta in 1996. He died in 2003 and he was buried with his marker facing the Atlanta skyline, which is interesting to see as a backdrop to the cemetery. So you're standing in a cemetery and you can see right over the ridge all these tall skyscrapers. So it's kind of weird to be in a cemetery and seeing all these skyscrapers everywhere. There was a little girl who kept a diary during the siege of Atlanta. Her name was Carrie Berry Crumley, and she was 10 at the time. Her journal is still used today by historians to get the perspective of a child's view of the Civil War. She died in 1921 and was buried in the original Six Acres. Carrie Still Logan died in 1900, and she was known as the Mother of Orphans. She was a former slave who founded the first African-American orphanage in 1888, and that home still exists today. Dr. Blanche Beatrice Saunders Thompson died in 1964, and she was one of Georgia's first African-American female doctors. Margaret Mitchell Marsh is buried here with a headstone she shares with her husband. There are box elders at the corners of her plot with rose bushes. This was one that we definitely sought out. We didn't get a whole lot of time in the cemetery, so I was like, well, I want to see this, this, and this, and then we'll have to come back and really enjoy the place. She was born in 1900 and wrote the novel Gone with the Wind, for which she earned a Pulitzer Prize. A film of the same name was made in 1939 featuring Clark Gable and Vivian Lee. The story is an epic historical romance featuring the love story of Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara. Clark Gable was set for the part from the very beginning, but it took 1,400 women being interviewed before Lee was selected to play Scarlet. Mitchell died young at the age of 49. William Fuller was a pivotal person in the great locomotive chase as he was the conductor on the train that the Union stole, and he led the chase that ended in a capture of the Raiders, and he's been buried here. And speaking of that, there are great memorials and statues here, some of which we've posted on Instagram, There's the Great Locomotive Chase Marker, which documents this moment in history that took place on April 12, 1862. What happened is that a group of Union Raiders stole a Confederate locomotive and took it all the way north to Chattanooga with hopes of destroying the railroad lines. There was a chaotic pursuit. There's the granite carriage step here that is the last of its kind in Oakland, and it was used back in the days of picnics for women to get out of their carriages. Another remnant from that time is a hitching post for horses that is found on the eastern boundary of the original six acres. The Neal Monument was created in the 1890s in the neoclassical style and has many symbols. There's a woman holding an open book and a closed book indicating a completed life. There's a palm branch for spiritual victory over death, a laurel wreath indicating eternity, and a Celtic cross for eternal life and faith. There's this fabulous statue called out in the rain, and it's a fountain. Absolutely love it. It features two children standing under an umbrella with the fountain spraying down over them like rain, so it kind of shoots up the middle of the umbrella and then comes down. It's very, very cool, and since it was raining, it was just poetic to see this wonderful statue there with the rain coming down and these kids under an umbrella. It was made from cast iron by the J.L. Mott Ironworks Company of New York. The gray plot features a statue of Niobe, who was a woman that had 14 children, and she bragged to the goddess Leto about these children. Leto was the mother of twins Artemis and Apollo, and they murdered all of Niobe's children. Thus, the statue is a symbol of grief. And she does look very sad with her head down. The most amazing memorial is for the unknown Confederate dead and features a lion known as the Lion of Atlanta. The Atlanta Ladies Memorial Association erected this in 1894, and they were inspired by Switzerland's Lion of Lucerne. The lion is mortally wounded by a broken spear and is clutching the Confederate battle flag. 
Another Confederate monument is an obelisk made from Stone Mountain granite that was dedicated on General Lee's funeral day in 1870. It stands 65 feet tall and was the tallest structure in Atlanta at the time, which I find hard to believe. That's just amazing. We were walking around and we stumbled across this really unique tombstone. It was a seashell that had this, what looked like a baby inside of it. It was very, very worn, so it was hard to see the details. But I was like, what is this? Is this a cherub in a shell? Is it supposed to be a a mermaid or something? I just couldn't figure it out. I thought it was very unique, but it turns out it really wasn't that unique. These memorials were sold in the Sears Roebuck and Company catalog and feature an infant sleeping inside a seashell, and they were used to mark children's graves. The seashell symbolizes resurrection and baptism. As I said, the mausoleums here are huge, and they are amazing. They're elaborate, just beautiful. I took many pictures, and I put them up on Instagram. There's the eclectic Elsus mausoleum that is the final resting place for Jacob Elsus, whose family owned the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mills. The Jacobs Mausoleum is done in the Beaux Arts classical style and was built in the 1890s. We have Dr. Joseph Jacobs to thank for Coca-Cola because his downtown pharmacy was the first to serve the soft drink in 1886. He died in 1929 and was buried here. The Rawson Mausoleum is eclectic in style and built in 1880 and is the final resting place of Charles Collier, his daughter Julia Harris, and her husband Julian Harris. Julian's father was Joel Chandler Harris, who wrote Uncle Remus. The Jasper Newton Smith Mausoleum is neat, and I spotted it almost immediately upon entering the cemetery, and I made my way over to it quickly because I'd never seen a mausoleum with a statue of someone sitting outside of it, and he's sitting up at the roof level. The mausoleum is eclectic in style and was built in 1906. Jasper was a real estate entrepreneur and wanted to face the entrance of the cemetery so he could watch all the comings and goings. And that really is. He's facing towards the main street that comes in the main gate. And there's a little bit more about him coming up when it comes to the haunting. So remember his name. And maybe that's why I was pulled to that. The Calhoun Mausoleum was built in 1910 in the Greek Revival style and is the final resting place of Atlanta's first eye, ear, and nose doctor who performed the first cataract surgery in the city. The stained glass window is really cool, featuring Jesus healing a blind man and a woman and man awaiting healing, pointing to their ear and throat, respectively. The Austell Mausoleum is probably the fanciest mausoleum in the cemetery and was the most expensive when it was built in 1883 in the Gothic Revival style. The Wade Hill Mausoleum is the only brick mausoleum here and one of the oldest. Tragic story is connected to it as Wade Hill's grandson killed his own brother and then himself. They're buried in an unmarked grave next to the building. The Inman family plot is amazing with its symbolism. There are faces of the Inman children here modeled from their actual death mass. Hugh is depicted as a boy cherub flying above rocks and lifting a mantle from a casket, symbolizing a life built on a firm foundation with a triumph over the mystery of death. And Louise is depicted as a female cherub resting against a tree and recording life on a tablet symbolizing premature death. There are also many pets buried in the cemetery. That's not something that you really find a lot, but there were a lot of them here. And one of those is Tweet the Mockingbird. A lamb graces his tombstone because the sculptor could not make a mockingbird. So I guess he just figured, well, a lamb goes with babies. Maybe we could think of the mockingbird as a child. I don't know. The Potter's Field is believed to have 7,500 unmarked graves that contain both whites and blacks. Some coffins have been revealed to be rather expensive, so not everyone buried here seems to have been indigent. The African-American section is a reminder of a time when even segregation affected cemeteries. This was not a coveted section of the cemetery and was set on lower ground that tended to flood and disinter coffins. There are believed to be 800 unmarked graves here, and there's an effort to do some restoration of the graves. There is a mausoleum on the grounds that belongs to Antoine Graves, a prominent real estate developer. It's the only mausoleum on the African-American section. The Slave Square marker reveals that there was an original African-American burial area from 1853 to 1877 in the northeast corner of the original six acres. This was called Slave Square. The remains were disinterred and reburied in the African-American burial ground, and then their former plots were sold to whites. 
So basically they said, uh, you know, this land over here is really nice and that land over there is crap. So why don't we just move the former slaves here and these other African-American people here over to that crappy ground over there and then we can resell these plots. Really, really nice. It's already bad enough that they were segregated and then they were just dumped haphazardly into this lesser ground. As I said, I could go on and on about everything there is to see here, but it's time to talk ghosts. There are Confederate ghosts here probably for a variety of reasons. Part of the Battle of Atlanta took place inside the cemetery and many of the dead would be buried here. There were about 6,900 Confederate soldiers placed here with 3,000 of them not being identified. Full-bodied apparitions in Confederate uniforms have been seen in the Confederate section of the cemetery and have also been seen hanging from trees. Now, there are some people who say that the hanging bodies that they've seen in the trees are Union soldiers. So I'm not sure which is which, but they have seen soldiers hanging from the trees. Possibly these were those who were executed by hanging because of the great locomotive chase. I'm not sure if that might be the reason why or if these were prisoners of war. Not really sure. When investigators do a pretend roll call while they're in the cemetery, they'll claim to hear whispered names from disembodied voices or a disembodied hear, present, could also be heard. There are those two who say that they actually hear a disembodied roll call and then voices answering to it. A cemetery employee claims to have seen a shadowy figure moving through the cemetery. The statue featuring Jasper Newton Smith is said to get up out of its chair and climb down to the ground and then walks through the cemetery. Could this have been that shadowy figure? Oakland Cemetery is a cemetery bingo dream. There are so many symbols in this cemetery and the self-guided tour map that you can purchase details many of the symbols and their meanings. This is a must-see if ever in Atlanta. For us taphophiles, any cemetery is really a must-see. I've been to two of these that I've shared with you, so I've got two more to visit. Are any of them haunted? That is for you to decide. I know a lot of you love these Haunted Cemetery episodes, and I do as well, because I just absolutely love my cemeteries. want to encourage you guys to check out the website at historyghostbump.com, and if you want to send me some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. I got an email from Kelly. She says, I'm a new listener to your podcast, and I'm enjoying it immensely. I recently listened to the episode about the history of witch trials and was excited that you covered the Hildebrand Evans trial that took place in Bethel, Ohio. And if you'll recall, Jessica from Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos was the one who shared the history there. I just asked her if she'd look into it and and share a little bit about it. So thanks, Jess, for that. I lived in Bethel from 1984 to 1990, and there are a few more legends and myths associated with the trial. I heard a few from the locals and read and watched a few from Claremont County historian Rick Crawford's books and DVD about local hauntings. A Super America filling station now stands on the site of Nancy's Cabin. Employees and customers there experience paranormal experiences, mostly occurring in the refrigerated storeroom. Voices are heard, and sometimes an employee will be grabbed by an icy hand when in that room. There's a depression in the ground behind the store that still marks Nancy's Pond, where the trial took place. Although it's been proven that Nancy moved away and lived out her life in peace, the local legend states that she contracted pneumonia from being dunked in the pond in cold weather and died from it, cursing the town with her last breath. If this were true, it might explain why her spectral hands are so cold, aside from her penchant for refrigerated rooms. Also, allegedly, there was a parade of sorts, complete with a marching band from town to Nancy's cabin on the day of the trial. Small town folks love a spectacle. Having been a gothy newcomer to Bethel Tate High School in the 80s, I'd say the town folk haven't changed their attitude toward anyone quote-unquote different since those days. Thanks for writing, Kelly. And then I heard from Britt in Oregon. Hello, Diane. I'm a fairly new listener, and I listen to your podcast every day at work. I work inside of a prison in Oregon where there are a few haunted areas or intelligent paranormal activity. Before the construction of the prison, I hear that two dead bodies were found in the swamp body of water that was on the property. We are not sure what whom is haunting our facility, but it loves opening closet doors, knocking on the doors, and throwing books off the shelf. The facility is made of cement or some type of stone, and I know that type of material holds residual energy, if I understood that correctly. So I'm thinking it's probably limestone. Even our captain has his own little file on paranormal happenings at the prison. Well, that's very cool because usually they don't want to talk about that stuff. I particularly love listening to your podcasts on state hospitals, asylums, and prisons since I work on the mental health side of things. I'm so happy I still have like 250 more podcasts to listen to. 
Well, first, Britt, thank you so much for your work on the mental health side of those kinds of things, especially in those locations. It would be so much tougher, I would think. I really enjoy doing those episodes, even though they can be a little bit tougher because uh, the stories that go with those places are not very cool. And then I wanted to share a couple of things that were put up on the Spooktacular Crew group over on Facebook. First, we have Missy, who wrote, I just listened to the Kentucky Caves episode, and about two years ago, when we moved to Florida, we stayed in Kentucky and went to Mammoth Cave for a few days. When I was in the caves, I was with the tour guide, and she had a lantern, and she had set it down, and behind her on the wall in the cave, I saw a shadow that looked like the outline of a Native American with a headdress and everything. When I asked her about it and we kind of went and looked, there was nobody there, so I'm not sure what I saw, but I definitely believe there could be something in those caves. That's a pretty weird shadow to see. It's not just a shadow figure. It had a headdress. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Missy. And Summer wrote, I lost my son eight years ago today, Memphis Jack. He was 17 days old with a severe heart defect. He was a fighter but needed rest. I'm sharing because it kind of has an otherworldly connection, and I thought today was a good day to share it. I felt the ripple when he left. I see signs all the time, or what my brain says are signs, like cardinals and turtles. But my oldest daughter, Edison, born 18 months after Memphis, has had a connection to something we don't, since she was an infant. She wakes up with messages for family or friends and has always felt a connection to Memphis, even though they never met Earthside. My younger daughter, River, does not seem to share this connection. But the night she was born, a phone call came into my sister from an unknown number and a faint male voice saying happy birthday to River on her voicemail. She still has the voicemail as it was late, and she didn't hear the phone ring. Could it have been my son? I don't know. But it sure gives me hope that he's happy with his little sisters and connected to each of them in different ways. I can't wait to hug him again one day. So thank you so much for sharing that, Summer. Obviously, very sorry for your loss. I totally believe it's possible. If nothing else, I believe that we are given the opportunity to cross over from the veil every so often, particularly for family. We've had a great time in the Spooktacular Crew with this year's virtual trick-or-treat. It's a lot of work to put something like that together to get people matched up. You send out emails to everybody so that they can know each other's likes and dislikes and getting to know each other. I've taken over the reins the last couple of years, but as you can all imagine, October is really not a month for me to take on any extra stuff. So we've had some listeners step up to the plate, and one in particular is going to man this along with our Krampus giveaway that will be coming up for Christmas. So be watching for that to be coming probably here at the beginning of November. Wes Hawkins, he is one of our moderators and the Spooktacular crew. He is going to be heading up our gift exchanges in the future. So we want to thank Wes for that very much. Hey, Wes. Thanks for helping out. Screw this up. And I've got a cozy place over here just for you. Also, I want you guys to keep in mind, with Christmas coming, for those people who are executive producers at any level, I send you out a Christmas card and a little gift. I will be doing that again this year. Last year, I sent out decals to go on cars. I have a little something else up my sleeve for this year. If you want to get in on that, you have until the end of November to become an executive producer of History Goes Bump. You can do that either at Patreon or through PayPal. And you can sign up at the dollar level or anywhere above that. And you will be on the Christmas mailing list. For those of you who already are giving, make sure that you are current with your mailing address. And if you're over on PayPal, I will be sending you out an email. So whatever your PayPal email address is, Please pay attention to it because I will be asking for your mailing addresses. Or you could be proactive and send me your mailing address via email to historyghostbump at gmail.com. If I don't have your address, I can't send you the gift. All right. I want to thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the graveyard Vanessa Eccles, who will be added to our niche wall. And I want to thank for their one-time donations, Carly Vondrak and Veronica Rodriguez. Thank you for your support. You can find History Goes Bump on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Google Play, 
and anywhere you can listen to podcasts.